fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. I'm a professor of Jesus Christ. I love him with everything that's in me, even with his own love that he has planted in my heart. Hallelujah. And that's why I come to you every week and also do a Bible study right now in the book of Acts every week because I can't stop speaking of what I've seen and heard. And today we will hear from John in the book of First John or 1 John, however you like to call it. We will hear that he can't stop speaking either. That's the way it is when his love has filled your heart. Today, the title of my message is Fellowship with God. And so I will pray and then we will look at what John has to say in 1 John. Just four verses today because I have some things I have to do and show you before we actually get into the scripture. Father, I thank you for all the men and women over the ages who have made it so I can have this Bible in my hands. Much blood has been shed. Many lives have been lost that we could have this precious document that is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword and penetrates even to the point of dividing soul and spirit and joint and marrow and Lord Jesus, it, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. So I thank you for this word that judges us that we must measure ourselves against. And, and Lord, that's what keeps us growing and takes us on with you so that we are more and more like you. So as I teach this today, Holy Spirit, I teach what you have shown me. I teach in accordance with Orthodox Christianity. That is what has been agreed upon over the ages. And Lord, I pray by your spirit that you would touch people, that you would awaken people. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, fellowship with God. This is a wonderful word from John. And I want to tell you that what he's going to answer and what I pray the Holy Spirit will help me answer for you today is what is Christianity and how does belief in Jesus start the process of changing a believer's heart to the point where they have fellowship with God? What does that mean to have fellowship with God? It means we walk in this world as Jesus walked in this world. And that seems like a pretty high calling to me, far beyond anything I could do on my own. But oh, with Jesus, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Nothing, even me, as difficult as I was, I was not too difficult for him. So praise God. That is the wonderful part of the gospel. Doesn't make any difference how far away you are. Whoever is listening and watching today, I was very far away. And he has brought me very near. Not until I was 45 was I brought near. So it doesn't make any difference how long it's been that you've been away from God or have never come to him. It doesn't make any difference at all to him. Come. Hallelujah. So before I speak on these four verses, I'll read them to you. But before I kind of take them apart for you, I will need to explain to you why John wrote this letter. 1 John, verses 1 through 4. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life 
which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that the joy of you may be made complete. I took that from the little literal Greek to English. The joy of you may be made complete. How's that for a reason to write? <laughs> That's the reason I'm speaking. So the joy of you may be made complete. So that you have this fellowship with God. And I'll give you a hint of what it is. But we'll explain it more shortly. The Holy Spirit and me, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, it's a holy intimacy with the Father and with the Son. That's fellowship. So, what happened and what caused John to write this, he was very likely around 90 years old when he wrote it. But there was a heretical teaching, that is a false teaching, teaching that goes against this word that had sprung up. And it was kind of a precursor to what's known as Gnosticism. And I'm going to tell you what they denied that is very specifically a truth in this word. So this, this letter was written to expose and show the difference between Christianity and this early form of Gnosticism. And some of John's own flock have been drawn into this heresy. And I tell you that today there are heretical teachings into which Christians have been drawn. And the examples that the Lord asked me to give are the theology of success, prosperity theology, the faith movement, and the theology of self-esteem. Now, all of these are self-centered, and that runs absolutely contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the entire word of God. Jesus Christ did not die so you could have good self-esteem and be successful, so that you could speak things in and out of existence or any such things. He died for you because someone had to take your punishment for your sin, for you. He died because his father asked him to come and do it. And so these things that are kind of outgrowths of uh, Christianity, especially in this country, but even around the world now, these are heretical in that they, they are contrary to this word of God. They will say that they believe in Jesus Christ, and, but they have changed who he is. They believe in God, but they have changed who he is. They talk about the Holy Spirit and say they are filled with him, but they have changed who he is and what he does. So, it is just as Paul prophesied, these are very pleasing things to the ear. And Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves, that is, pile up all around themselves, teachers in accordance with their own desires. Now, back in those days, it wasn't possible to really pile them up. You might follow one or two or maybe three, but to pile them up, this is like a very big pile. That's what that word means, accumulate. That requires television. And that's all I need to say about that. So, here is what this early form of Gnosticism denied. Okay, they denied that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. They said Jesus was a man and the Christ came and possessed him. And then when he was going to a cross, the Christ left and then he came back and all kinds of, it's not in the word. 
they deny that Christ came in the flesh because he, he came, Jesus was just a man and he came in and then he left. They deny that Christians must obey Jesus' commands, including his command to love one another with God's actual love, agape, which I have taught on from the book of John. And it is upon this love that the whole will of God, the law and the prophets, hinge as I have taught you. So, they deny that you have to obey Jesus' commands. You can do whatever you want. Because your body is matter and your spirit is not matter. So it doesn't matter what you do in your body. <laughs> your spirit is pure and free and they deny, therefore, that they're born with a sin nature. And they deny that salvation comes only through the work of Christ. They say, you can work it. They deny that believers must be righteous on the inside in order to have fellowship with God. They deny that all believers are to live as Jesus lived when he walked on the earth. And they deny that all believers need fellowship. In other words, you can be a lone ranger, and that's fine. And they believe they denied that John, who wrote this letter, was an apostle. So they denied all those things. And John was grieved at this teaching, but he didn't come at them in an angry way. How did he combat this? With the truth of God's word with the truth, and with his own eyewitness experience, and that of the rest of the 11, well, 12 actually, because they added Matthias and he had seen everything. And even the eyewitnesses of the uh, 500 who saw him after he was risen. So, he was grieved, but he didn't come against it with anger. He came against it with truth and what he had actually seen and heard and touched. He taught what Christianity all through this letter, and we're going to go through the whole thing over the next few weeks. He taught what Christianity is and what it is not. And he taught that Jesus saves us and then he changes our hearts when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit. It is indeed lovely, powerful, and freeing. Hallelujah. He speaks of what he's seen and what he's heard, what he's touched. He can't stop speaking about it, like I said in the beginning. Hallelujah. And neither can I. So he first, in the beginning here, teaches us that he is an eyewitness and that the whole purpose of this letter is fellowship. So let's start going down through it. What was from the beginning, chapter 1, verse 1 of 1 John, what was from the beginning? What was from the beginning? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. What was from the beginning, that is Jesus Christ. What we have heard, that is literally to not only hear, but to understand, and that was live and in person, as we'll see. What we have seen with our eyes. He's not touching, talking about just spiritually seeing. He's talking about literally seeing him as clearly as I literally see Jeff across from me this morning. What we have looked at that is stared at. What we have just been amazed to see so much that we can't take our eyes off him. I like that and touched with our hands. Literally, we touched Jesus when he was on the earth, and we touched him when he rose. He made us breakfast. 
among other things. He blew on us and said, receive a measure of the Holy Spirit. We followed him. We went where he told us to go. We did what he told us to do. We were with him, literally, while he walked the earth. We have touched him with our hands. And this is about so that we would not have any question about what this is about. What I'm, I'm going to explain to you, he said, through this letter, what we have seen and heard and touched. That is the word of life. We know that Jesus Christ is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And in the first chapter of John, in the 14th verse, the word came and dwelled among us. Oh my goodness, that's Jesus. Verse 2, and the life was manifested. That is, he, God, showed us Christ, whom we saw, literally, and touched, and heard, and understood. And we have seen, again, he says, we have seen him. We are eyewitnesses of him. We have seen this life, this eternal life. And we testify because we are eyewitnesses. And everyone who is filled with Jesus testifies because he is in them and has made them his witnesses, just as if you were testifying as a witness at a trial. He makes you able to testify. Hallelujah. With power. We testify and proclaim to you, we preach to you, we speak to you the eternal life. He always was, in the beginning, before anything was, was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. We have seen him and we testify and we proclaim to you the eternal life. Which, who, was with the Father. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And was manifested to us, was shown to us. We saw him, we touched him, we felt him. Hallelujah. It comes against the false teachings without him ever saying, I'm coming against these false teachings. This he knows because he himself has experienced it. And it was manifested to them, shown by the Father. You know, think about this too. When John and James and Peter were invited by Jesus to go up on top of the mountain, they saw his glory manifested. Peter speaks of it. And I believe it's First Peter. Let's go there for a minute. Let's back a little bit. He says, we didn't dream him up. Ah, it's in Second Peter. In verse uh, chapter 1, verse 17, For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in, with whom I am well pleased. And verse 18, And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And that refers to the Mount of Transfiguration. So those three saw his glory before he was glorified. That was when Moses and Elijah were seen by them with Jesus on the mountain. Hallelujah. And I want to say also that this touch is verified by contact. You remember me talking about that last time in a spiritual sense that when, <laughs> when you believe into Jesus, he verifies that by contacting you and you say, Abba, Father, <laughs> and you know God is your Father. And then when you're filled with the Spirit, you say that again. It's like, oh my goodness, now you're in me. I know you're my Father first, and then now you're in me. Oh my. <laughs> oh my. 
fellowship. Oh, glory to God. Oh. So. They have literally seen him. And they proclaim him. And they testify of him. Why? Verse 3. What we have seen and heard, again, we proclaim to you also. That is, I proclaim this to my flock. I proclaim this to the ones of my flock who are following this early version of Gnosticism. And I proclaim it to you today. We proclaim to you also. Why? So that... Verse 3, you too may have fellowship with us. They currently don't, some of them. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. If you listen to these words and you look at what the early Gnostics denied, you see him coming against everything that they denied. They want you, beloved. He wants you, beloved, through this letter and through his testimony and through his proclamation in this letter. He wants you to have fellowship. But it is not ordinary fellowship as American Christians think of it. It isn't about going to church on a Sunday morning and saying hello and shaking a hand or a hug, giving a hug, and sitting and praying and standing up when worship happens and sitting back down and hearing a message from someone. That's not this fellowship. This fellowship is koinonia. And the reason this fellowship is not what most American Christians think, and probably others around the world too, this fellowship is a spiritual joining. It is a spiritual joining of you and me in one place, not a physical hello. There is a spiritual thing that goes on with koinonia. And not only is there this spiritual connection and spiritual fellowship between you and other believers, but there is this spiritual fellowship between you and God the Father and God the Son. It is communication It is communion. It is union. When you are united with him, when you are one with him, and you are one with each other, as Jesus prayed in John 17, when you are filled with the very same love that the Father has for the Son, like he prayed in 1726 of John, then koinonia happens. Hallelujah. It is divine fellowship. It is not earthy fellowship. The other things are very nice. Saying hello, getting a hug, sitting down, praying, standing up to worship, all those things, they're very good. They're nice. But that's not koinonia. And what he wants and the reason he writes this letter is so that you may come to a place where you have koinonia. Ah, fellowship with God, fellowship with the Son, and fellowship with others in that same divine character, nature, in the same way. Now, if there are some that do not yet know koinonia, the point is, that they would see this fellowship, this divine fellowship, by your example. And that they would hunger after it. Because 
this fellowship comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit, and this fellowship is what keeps you from the error of heresies. You immediately can identify them because the word of God is in you. <laughs> the word is in you. you. You read this word because you love it. You learn the truth. And then the truth sets you free from slavery to sin. And you just continue in fellowship with God in this word as you read it with others who have fellowship with God, like John, with the Father and with the Son, as we all gather together, not just you and Jesus in the Word. That's wonderful too. But you and Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, all, oh my goodness. That is a fellowship that strengthens and encourages you like no other kind. No other kind. It's koinonia, beloved. It's intimate. It's holy. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's that 24-7 connection. And you go, and there's another who has that 24-7 connection, and another over here who has that 24-7 connection, and you connect. <laughs> because you're all connected to the same one. <laughs> it's like having one of those power strips. <laughs> oh my, and you're all plugged in. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, thank you for that, Lord. But it's much more powerful than that kind of a power strip. Glory to God. And so we encourage each other and our behavior and our character and our nature that is different than what you have when you're saved, but not yet filled with the Spirit as Jesus commands. That, that nature draws them to want that too. Ha. Ah. It's never with judgment that you look at the ones who are saved but have not experienced this, what Charles Wesley called the second work of grace. <laughs> and it is a gracious work indeed. It is his influence on your heart and the reflection in your life, beloved. It's like a spiritual banquet of joy to which you all sit down and you sup with Jesus and him with you. It's what he calls the church at Laodicea in, uh, in Revelation 3, the end of Revelation 3. It's what he calls them to do. If anyone hears me knocking in this church, he says this to believers, and lets me in. Mm -hmm. He will sup with me and I with him. Talk about intimacy. It's a spiritual banquet. The finest of things. The finest of wine. All the very best food for your spirit. And as you're sitting with him and supping with him, he speaks to you. You speak with him. The Father speaks, you speak with him, the Holy Spirit encourages your spirit because you are having communion because of your union. You have become one with the one who saved you and loved you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when that happens, verse 3, so you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write, not only so that you too may have fellowship, but so that 
my NASB says our joy, but the Greek to English says the joy of you may be made complete, perfected. His perfect joy in you. Oh my. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory, as I've told you many times. It is an overwhelming joy. It is much better than, much more than feeling welcome when you walk into a church. If you just see joy. Unspeak, you can't even describe it. There's no description for this joy that you see. And then when you're filled with him, that you experience. Some people call it the higher life. I don't see that in here. I call it being filled with the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Because you're filled with his fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, spirit control. Hallelujah. So you're filled with his joy so that your joy, so that you may be filled, so that you may have his perfect joy in you. Complete, filled perfected in you. That's why he writes this letter. And so you must stay tuned so that his joy will fill you. And then you will walk about with such joy that everyone around you is drawn to our Savior, Jesus Christ, And so that they can say to Abba, Father. And then, oh, Abba, Father, you're in me. Jesus, you're in me. Holy Spirit, you're in me. Oh, and the joy wells up from the spring of salvation. Jesus Christ, glory to God. The joy of you may be made complete, made full, crammed full, perfectly fulfilled. He is speaking of being filled with the Holy Spirit, just as the Father and the Son promised. Remember Jesus in Acts 1-4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father promised, which you heard of from me, Jesus says. For John, that is the Baptist, Baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John, baptized with water for repentance. I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And as John the Baptist reported, fire to burn off everything that is not of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Then you walk on. (laughs) You do walk on, but you walk on pure. You walk on having 24-7 fellowship. Jesus promises this joy in John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And his prayer to the Father says, Now I have come to you and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. These things we write so that the joy of you may be made complete. That uh, quote uh, from the prayer to the Father is John seventeen thirteen. And after Pentecost... Luke, writing of these things, says, and the disciples were continually filled (laughs) with joy and with the Holy Spirit. They go hand in hand. Oh, my goodness. So if you're filled, then you know the truth. What we have seen so that you too may have fellowship with us. That is this 24-7 connection and may be filled with the same joy that we have. Your being filled is the fulfillment of God's will. The other thing that you will be able to do and you'll see it as we walk through 1 John is you will be able to walk 
like Jesus walked on the earth. High calling, tall order. When he's in you, you can do it. And that's from 1 John 2, 6. And you will be able to speak his truth and the power of the Holy Spirit as one who has experienced it just as they literally experienced Christ when he walked on the earth and also when he filled them. Hallelujah. So, as a result of you coming into this fellowship and you being filled with God, Many will be saved. Many will be filled. Not by anything you can do on your own, but by him who is in you. He will give you the words. He will place people in front of you. He will do it, just as he did Philip. Go run up to that chariot where the eunuch is, reading exactly what I wanted him to read at exactly the time I wanted you to run up. So you could tell him about Jesus. Hallelujah. So how is it with you, beloved? Are you following one of the heresies I talked about that is in today's church? The faith movement? The theology of self-esteem? The theology of success? Any of those? Are you following them? If so, turn. Repent. Ask God to open this word to you, the whole thing, so that you have the whole counsel of God, the whole understanding of his nature and his will. Ask him if you belong to him, if you are a believer in Jesus. Ask him. Ask your father to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Your Father in heaven will do it. And that's from Luke 11, 13. Then you will be, then you will have this joy fill you right up. Then you will have this fellowship from which that joy stems. Hallelujah. And people will be drawn. And for you who do not know Jesus, you are here listening, watching, or reading this message for a reason. God calls you to himself. I didn't come until I was 45. He never got tired of calling. He won't get tired of calling you. There will be a time when he no longer calls, but we have not come to that point. While it is still day, while the light is still in this world, we call. And he is calling you to himself through us, that you would confess your sin to the Lord. You don't have to confess it to men, confess it to him. He already knows it. You say, oh yes, Lord, this and this and this is true of me. And I am a sinful man. Just as Peter said, or a sinful woman, just as Peter said when the Lord gave them their miraculous catch. In Luke 5, he says, get away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Turn away from what you're doing and turn toward God and ask to be forgiven through Christ Jesus. Enter into life. And leave death behind. Hallelujah. And if you are going to a church where some of these other things are taught, then it is very likely that you have never heard of this kind of fellowship. Because what they're teaching you is all about you. Instead of all about God and your relationship to him. So, If you're in that kind of a church, leave. If you're in a church where everyone really is warm and loving and says hello and all of that, but you know that's not the kind of fellowship John is describing and and that I am describing to you, 
Pray for them. Pray for yourself to have that fellowship. Pray for them to have that fellowship with the Father and with the Son and with others who have it. Hallelujah. It's for his glory that he would just show himself through you to such a degree that they would be drawn into this completeness of the work of God. Remember, I said you do keep growing, but you grow at a phenomenal rate because he's in you. Oh, it's glorious. I want to tell you, just as I close, that I had a prophetic word for a church not long ago. No one was willing to listen. <laughs> The Lord said this. I think a couple did. The Lord said this. I will bring my light to this place. And they will say, what is this light? We have not seen it. And then they will fall down and worship me. Lord, I pray that you would make that so. That there would come into all the churches who fellowship in the way humans fellowship. Would you call all churches, would you just step down, not in a revival that we schedule, but in a surprise visit? Would you step down? Would you show them your light? And they would say, we've never seen this before. What is this light? And then they would fall down you, before you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they would worship the Father and the Son. Hallelujah. Make it so, I pray. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan.